This is the ninth lecture for MA 1012 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we'll look at the cross product of vectors. The cross product is much more complicated than the dot product and has a much more complicated definition, which is hard even to remember. Um, the cross product of two vectors is going to be a vector. So if we write vectors A is A1, A2, A3, and B is B1, B2, B3, then the cross product A cross B of those vectors is given by the unpleasant formula A2, B3 minus A3, B2, comma. That's the first component. Then the second component is um, A3, B1 minus A1, B3. And the last component is A1, B2 minus A2, B1. So it's a mess. Uh, it's not easy to remember. Uh, you could remember it as, uh, well, in terms of determinants. Let's do that another time. Uh, so there are other ways to think of it in terms of determinants. But we haven't done determinants yet, so um, we'll worry about that later. Um, anyway, the point being it's a vector, and it's a very complicated expression to compute from one vector and another vector, a third vector. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a mess. Um, uh, but it's it's deeply uh, related to the notion of, of rotation in three dimensions. And that's why we didn't see it when we worked, if we just worked with vectors in the plane, we wouldn't run into this cross product because rotations are much simpler in the plane than they are in three-dimensional space. We do a simple example out. Um, the first thing to remember is, again, that the inputs are, are vectors and the output is also a vector. So if you don't get a vector, you definitely got it wrong. Um, if we were to take an example like 3, 4, 0, and cross product with minus 2, 2, 5, um, then we'd get doing a2, b3, a2, b3 is 4 times 5, minus a3, b2 is 0 times 2, and so on and so forth. I won't do it all. Um, there are, of course, two other such expressions that I should be working out. So this is 20 and then something else and something else, which I won't do. Um, it's just too much arithmetic to watch. So um, cross, cross product has enormously many identities, which are almost impossible to remember, all of them. Um, but some obvious ones, A cross B is minus B cross A. That's the most surprising one. The dot product was symmetric in the A and the B. This one is anti-symmetric, which is very surprising. Um, it still has certain linearity properties. A cross B plus C is A cross B plus A cross C. It expands out in the in that B variable, and obviously in the A variable as well. It has various other properties. Um, perhaps the most striking uh, of, of those properties, and one that is actually going to be helpful, is that the dot product of A with A cross B and the dot product of B with A cross B is zero. And that's, again, this, these, all these properties require expanding out. And the expanding out in this horrible expression is quite complicated. It takes a while to get it out. So it's not a very simple one. Um, but we can say that um, a few other things about it. One is that the length of A cross B. If we compute it all out, it's quite unpleasant. You get that it's the length of A times the length of B times the sine of theta where uh, theta is the angle from A to B. Um, theta is the angle from A to B. Um, so it gives you some idea of how long the cross product is. It wants to, rather than the, the dot product, which wanted to say that if A and B were sort of pretty much in the same direction, it wanted to give you a, um, a quantity that was, that was close to the product of the lengths. Now this one does, does something quite different. If A and B are pretty much in the same direction, it gives you, wants to give you zero. Um, because if they go pretty much in the same direction, the sine of their angle is zero. Uh, sine of zero is zero. So it's a very different kind of an object. It likes them to be in perpendicular directions to make it very, become a large, uh, a large vector. It wants to be, be perpendicular, so the sine of theta will be nearly um, 90 degrees. It'll be um, at a near to 90 degree angle. The sine of theta is near one. And so you just get something like the product of the length. So it wants it to be perpendicular to make it big. That's a, another surprising fact about the cross product as opposed to the dot product. But also, if we look back at these, at this weird 
uh, collection of identities here, what it tells us is about the direction. This tells us how big it is. How big it is is a times b times the sine of the angle between them. But how, uh, what direction does it point in? Well, it doesn't point in the direction of a because its stop product a is zero. It doesn't point in the same direction as b because its stop product b is zero. In fact, it's perpendicular to a and b. So we can now begin to draw a picture of it if we have an a vector and a b vector then the cross product, whatever it is, must be perpendicular to both. So if we draw the plane that that's spanned by A and B, the cross product must be going perpendicular to that plane. And that's one very important fact about it that we want to keep in mind, because it's easy to picture what it looks like. You have a plane that has A and B in it, and perpendicular to that plane, you have the cross product. So that tells you up to, well, up to the sign, whether it's this way or this way. It tells you what, what, what does the cross product look like. It wants to go... Um, a perpendicular to A and B, and if A and B are, are going to be at 90 degree angles to one another, that's when it wants to be sort of the biggest for a fixed size of A and B. Um, it wants to be biggest when A and B are perpendicular, and then these would all three be perpendicular. So that's what it sort of likes, the picture of the cross product likes. And if you try and do something else, you try and make A and B come close to the same direction, it, gets, it shrinks um, down. So we get some idea of what it means. The cross product is often uh, also called the, the vector product because it's a vector. A cross B is a vector for A and B a vector, remember? So it's not a, unlike the dot product, which is a number. This is a vector product, so it's often called the vector product instead of the cross product. And a common notation for it, especially um, in, uh, for example, in France and many other uh, countries in continental Europe, is A wedge B. Our next task is to think about um, the, the geometry of, of simple uh, geometric objects. The most important objects we're going to have to deal with will be lines and planes. So we're interested in specifying things like drawing a picture of a line in space or a picture in space of a plane, an infinite flat plane. I'll just draw a little square piece of it, a little rectangular chunk of the plane, but we're thinking of it as being infinitely extended on in, in those directions forever. Um, so and also the line goes on forever in both directions, but we just draw a little piece of it. Um, so how do we specify uh, a line in three-dimensional space, and how do we specify a plane? Let's start off with a line. Um, one way to describe a line in space is to say uh, that if we knew two points that were on the line, then it would be the line that passes through those two points. So there's only one, and so once you give two points on it, you're, you're done with specifying what line that is. Although we still have to figure out how do we decide if another point belongs or doesn't belong to the line through those two points. Another way to describe a line would be to s describe only one point that lies on it, but also to describe a vector that tells us which direction it goes from there. So that's a different story. That's really taking the displacement between these two. If I take these two points and take their displacement vector, that could be their displacement vector, and then I'd have a one point. One point. I forget the other one. I just remember the displacement vector. So it's the point that goes through this point. It goes this way. So you can see that that uniquely specifies the line. So let's see if we can do use uh, these these ideas geometrically to calculate uh, the equations of lines. So so if we start with this one, um, that this picture, what we'll do is we'll take a line um, through a given point p naught and going in a particular uh, with a particular vector a. And we'll try to figure out what are the points that lie on that line. But a point lies on that line just when it starts off at p naught and then is given by, by adding some amount of a to it. So in other words, a p is on the line uh, just when, just when um, the, um, so we want to ask what point p is on the line, um, just when the, the, the vector going from 0 to p that's this vector here, um, is, um, is going to be the vector going from 0 to p naught. This is this vector here, plus some multiple of a, plus some multiple t a. So for example, if p naught is the point x naught, y naught, z naught, the vector that goes from 0 to p naught is simply uh, the same vector, x naught, y naught, z naught, because we start at the, the origin being 0, 0, 0. If you like, you could write it as x naught i plus y naught j plus z naught k. Um, 
and then a is some vector, which is some a naught uh, i plus a well a one i plus uh, what have I done? Um, so uh, yeah, the notes are going with a i plus b j plus c k, um, which is maybe not very nice because now I've used the letter a for two different things. But if we had, like the entries of this vector also be called uh, be called a b c, which is just following the notes. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I won't get the get it right. Um, so let's uh, let's try and figure out then what is the what are the the points p that lie on this line? Then you'd have to have that o p uh, is some x y. Z or some x i plus y j plus z k, but it has to be o p naught plus t a, so it has to be x naught i plus y naught j plus z naught k plus t times this vector, which I say unfortunately has maybe I could try and make that bold. Um, if I tried hard, I could maybe make it bold. Okay, um, so then uh, this is some a i plus b j plus c k. And so expanding that out into i components, you get x naught plus t a uh, i. That's that's the non-bold a. Um, y naught plus t b j, and z naught plus t c k. So those are all the points that lie on that line. Um, so that's what we call the the parametric equation of the line. So we can write that again as uh, this is x i plus y j plus z k. So in other words, we can say that the points that lie on this line are the points x equals x naught plus t a, y equals uh, y naught plus t b, and z equals z naught plus t c. Those are the points that lie on our line. Once we're given the x naught, y naught, z naught, and the a, b, c, then we know what all the points are that lie on that line. In the plane, the geometry of lines is a bit simpler than three-dimensional space because we know that in the plane, you'd have to have um, lines would either uh, have to be parallel or else they'd have to meet um, somewhere. Uh, those are the only two possibilities. In three-dimensional space, it's a little more complicated. You could have um, the possibility in three dimensions of having... Um, lines be parallel, going in other words, the same direction. Um, or you could have a different possibility, which is that they could um, they could meet. Um, so obviously this is somewhat rare. If you perturb them a little bit, they won't be parallel anymore. You could still have, you have the possibility that they meet um, at some point. But that's also, now in three dimensions, that's also a little bit um, a sensitive, rare situation. If you perturb them a little bit, um, you'd expect that to be broken, and you expect that they become something else. Um, you could have lines which are so-called skew lines, um, which are never non-intersecting and non-parallel. Um, so you could have this line and then another line that doesn't intersect because it lies on top of it in our picture. Um, so they don't actually run into each other. They're called skew. These are parallel, and these are intersecting. So skew lines have to lie in parallel planes. This one lies in one plane, this one lies in a parallel plane. So if we had lines given by equations, we could ask if they intersect or not. So line L1 given by equations uh, that the position of, let's say, r of point on the line is uh, measured um, as, uh, the, uh, as some, uh, uh, the vector going to some point p1 plus some multiples, we'll call it s instead of t, of some vector a1. And if we had some other guy, line L2, so the position vector or point of the line should be o p2 plus some parameter times a2. And the parameter values don't have to be matching where they intersect. Um, so they could intersect at some point where this is described well, using some parameter s, this is described using maybe a different parameter t. Um, they'd have to intersect somewhere. So if they intersect, we could ask, do they intersect? Uh, and we'd answer that question by trying to solve the equation that they're equal. OP1 plus SA1 has to equal OP2 plus TA2. 
uh, and we'd have to ask whether or not this equation has any, has some solution. And when I say some solution, I mean for some value of s and some value of t. Now this will be three equations. When you write out the x, y, and z components, you'll have three linear equations which involve s and t. And so typically there won't be any solution. Typically there's no values of s and t that solve three equations in the two unknowns, s and t. But there might be. And if there was, was to be, then you'd just solve it by solving those linear equations. So I'll let you do some there some examples in the notes of this sort of thing where you can calculate out some exa explicitly some, some, uh, some solutions of these sorts of equations. Now if we want to generalize this picture to planes instead of, or extend it to planes instead of lines, we have to think differently about how we specify a plane in a three-dimensional space. If we have a plane floating in space, um, it's going to have some um, point lying on it, and then we can describe maybe two vectors that lie on it instead of one, and that'll somehow uh, give it, determine which plane it is. It's the one that passes through this this point and happens to have these two the independent vectors lying on it and you know, going in different directions, so to speak. Then every point of the plane will be made up out of some combination of those vectors because you'll take some amount of this vector and some amount of this vector and say this point is made up out of that much of this vector and that much of that vector. So it'll be a, a, a multiple of one plus a multiple of the other by little, making a little parallelogram. And so we'll say that um, if we have a, a point, so we have a point P0 on, on our plane, uh, and if we have uh, vectors uh, A and B, um, uh, vectors uh, lying in the plane, then our plane can be given by saying the points of the plane, again, vector r, uh, position vector r for the point of the plane is some uh, a vector going from the origin to some point of the plane, point p of the plane, and that's just uh, this position vector of this location here is p naught on the plane there, and then plus some amount of vector a plus some amount of vector b. So that's the kind of equation we'd expect to describe a plane. Another way to describe a plane, so let's we'll, let's give the general methods and then we'll try and see if we can come up with some examples. Um, another way to describe the plane is to say that we know, we know that it's got to be a plane through a particular point P0 and with a particular vector normal to it. So uh, some vector that goes normal to it, say N. Um, where would you get such a vector from? Um, well, if we already had this a and b um, in our plane, this point p naught, and if we happen to have a vector a and some vector b, and they both lay in that line, that plane, and go in different directions, then we know that their cross product vector will in fact be perpendicular to both of them, and they lie in the plane. So the perpendicular vector will go perpendicular to them, uh, going perpendicular to that plane. And so if we wanted to specify a point of the plane and a normal, we could start with a point of the plane and two vectors that lie in the plane going in different directions. Take their cross product vector and get a normal vector. If we had the position vector and a normal vector, some position vector and some normal vector, we could ask, what's the equation of the plane? How do we write down what, po what equation the points have to satisfy? Well, in order to be in the plane, uh, we have this say this normal vector, and um, and we have some point P0 in the plane. If we want to know if some other point P is in the plane, what we need to know is that this is perpendicular to this, that the position vector is actually perpendicular to the normal vector. Our, displ our displacement vector is perpendicular to the normal vector. So P0 is, uh, sorry, P is in the plane uh, through uh, P0 with normal vector n exactly when, just exactly if and only if, exactly when um, uh, the displacement from p naught to p vector uh, is perpendicular to n. And that we know means that um, p naught p is perpendicular to n is exactly the same as p naught p dot n. Uh, sorry, p naught p dot n is zero. That's how you test if two vectors are perpendicular. So we can see a test, we can see an equation for this guy. But that means if we write, if um, let's say C is the vector, which is uh, OP 
P naught, then we can write P naught P equals um, P equals uh, O P uh, minus O P naught. Um, so it gives us uh, an equation for the thing that if we want to write this guy as um, let's say is r minus c if r is going to be a precision vector and so we get uh, p naught p dot n is zero uh, well is it zero if and only if r dot c uh, r minus c dot n is zero um, so we get an equation for the plane or a, another way to write that is r dot n equals c dot n so we get a different description of the equation of the plane so we can write our equation of the plane in this kind of expression as vectors, um, where this is the unknown position of point in the plane, this r, and we know the n and the c. So we get a linear equation for points that belong to the plane. So let's just do a simple example. Um, if we take uh, the um, equation of the plane, take the equation, let's see, so we'll take a plane given by simple equation uh, let's see suppose we had an n as our normal vector it's a not vector normal to the plane so we're given there is this normal vector n and suppose it's given as having values the 2 minus 3 1 and then suppose that the plane is supposed to pass through a given point p naught p naught is a point of the plane with coordinates uh, 0 p naught equal to c which is um, uh, let's say c is uh, uh, what do I want to do here c is 4 um, 5 minus 3 say then how do we calculate the equation of the plane the equation of the plane is we have some unknown point r and belonging to the plane okay point of plane it's going to be any point of the plane. And we want to say that the equation of the plane is r dot n equals c dot n. OK. That's the, how we find an equation of the plane. So how do we work out that equation of the plane? In, uh, in this case, r is x, y, z, the unknown point. That's all we can say about it. Uh, n is the given normal vector, which is up here somewhere, this guy here. So it's 2 minus 3, 1. And it has to equal c dot n, where c is this point we're given here, 4, 5, minus 3. And n again is 2, oh, sorry, 2 uh, minus 3, 1. So, um, so putting those together on this side, we get 2x minus 3y plus 1z. That's how we do a dot product, right? Multiply the entries, multiply the entries, multiply the entries, and then add them up. So uh, x times 2, y times minus 3, z times 1, and added them all up. And this side we multiply the entries and add them up. 4 times 2 uh, times 2 plus 5 times minus 3 plus minus 3 times 1. Um, so putting that together, it's 8 uh, minus 15 minus 3. So minus 15 minus 3 is minus 18, plus 8 is minus 10. And so we put those together and we get an equation for the plane, which is fine of the equation 2x minus 3y plus z equals minus 10. That's the equation of the plane that passes through uh, it has this normal vector and passes through this point. The equation passes through this point, normal to this vector, is given by this equation here. So as, as another example, let's suppose we try to find um, the equation of the plane. Um, find the equation of the plane um, containing two lines one line which is going to be the line given by x is 1 minus t y is 2 plus 3t and z is 2t that's one line and then another line 
is the one given by the equation x minus 1 equals z minus 4 over 2 and and uh, y is and y is 5. Those are two equations and three unknowns, so we'd expect that their solution has uh, one unknown left. In other words, we expect it's, the, the, it's some kind of one-dimensional thing, and since the, the two equations are linear equations, it's going to be a line. So this is a parametric description of a line because there's a parameter t in it, and each of x, y, and z are linear functions of t, so that must draw out a line, we'd expect at least. And since they're non-zero linear functions, they move, it moves as t moves, so it has to move along a line. This also has to be a line because it's uh, given by two linear equations and three variables, which are independent equations, so that each one cuts out, cuts down dimension by one, and so you get a line. Now if we if we move this parameter here, we can see this guy is given by x, y, uh, z equals, um, well, we have this 1, 2, and 0 uh, constant terms, and then the linear terms are it's t times minus 1, 3, and 2. The t terms are minus 1t, 3t, 2t, it's 1, 3, 2. So those are the t terms, and those are the constant terms. So you can see this guy is given by this point plus motion in this direction. So this is some O p naught vector plus t times a vector. So you can see this is the vector that lies tangent to this to this plane, and so this one must be in there. So a equals minus 1, 3, 2 moves, um, moves us inside this plane that we want to draw. We want an equation of this plane, and it's going to have this vector lying tangent to it. So if we take a point of it, this point p naught of it, and we move along that a, they have to be moving in inside that plane. Now we're going to take the, these equations and work with them. We can think of this second line, so that's all from the first line. Um, we can think of the second line as being given by parameterized by knowing the value of x. So we could say, for example, solving that for as z in terms of x, we get x minus 1 equals z minus 4 over 2. So uh, z minus 4 equals 2x minus 2. And so uh, then z equals 2x plus 2, adding 4 to both sides. So that gives us an equation for z, and then we have y equals 5. So we can think of x as the parameter. It's parameterized by the value of x. Uh, y is always equal to 5 constant, and z is 2x. Which means that if we move the x, y, and the z, um, we can move in the direction, we move through the point uh, when x is 0. Let's say x is 0 point um, is going to be some point of our line. What point is it? It's going to be the point with coordinates x is 0, z is 2x plus 2 is, is 2, y is 5, so 5, 2. That's a point of our plane. But also we can see that as we move, we move with an x parameter. So we move with, uh, we start at this point and then time plus x times, x has to move at speed 1, um, giving us x. And then y is always 5, so it moves with speed 0 as we move x. And then z has to be 2x plus 2. We got the 2 here, we've got, the, we got 2x here to get to be z. So these are the points of that line of points of the second line, L2. They're the points that look like this for any value of x. And that means in particular that this vector, b equals 1, 0, 2, must uh, lie uh, tangent to the line, tangent to our plane. In other words, if we move on that along with that was our velocity, we stay on our plane. So we now have a plane, and we have a point we have, well, we actually have two points on it, but we had a point P naught on it previously, which we said was the point um, 1, 2, 0, was on the plane. And we now have two vectors, an A and a B. And the A vector that we computed out before was uh, minus 1, 3, 2. And if we st moved along that vector, we stayed in the plane. And we have this B vector, which is calculated here, uh, 1, 0, 2. And if we move along that one, we stay in the plane. So that gives us two vectors in line a point that lie in our plane. Now we just have to take advantage of those vectors and actually figure out what the plane is. So if we write those down again, we've got vectors which are um, we've got a point that lies in the plane, 1, 2, 0. And then we've got vectors that lie tangent to the plane, a equals minus 1, 3, 2. So as we move in that direction, we stay on our plane. 
B is 1, 0, 2. As we move in that direction, we stay in our plane. And so we can calculate a normal vector, which is just the cross product of the two vectors that are tangent. If you have two vectors going in two different directions and they're tangent to our plane A and B, then uh, the vector that's their cross product will be normal to them and normal to the plane. So that'll be a normal vector to the plane. And um, it's, of course, it's unpleasant to calculate out, so I'll leave you to do the calculation. So I'll leave you to calculate that 6, 4, minus 3 is the cross product of those two vectors, and that'll be the normal vector. So we can say that a point, then x, so r equals x, y, z, has to lie on, lies on our plane just when we have to have r dot normal equals c dot normal. And what was c and what was r? c could be, has to be the point on the plane, and n has to be our normal. r has to be x, y, z, so x, y, z, that's this guy, dot. Normal vector is 6, 4, minus 3. But it has to equal c dot n. c had to be a point of the plane, and that our point p naught was, in fact, on the plane. It uh, was 1, 2, 0. And the normal vector, 6, 4, minus 3, again. So we can expand those out and get an equation for the plane 6x plus 4y minus 3z has to equal 6 times 1 is 6, 2 fours are 8, and no 3s, which is 14. So we get a final equation 6x plus 4y minus 3z is 14. And if you're not sure you're getting it right, try, try and plug in points that you're convinced should be on the plane and make sure that it is actually, actually containing the points you want it to contain. Let's try to find a uh, solve a problem about lines instead of planes. So suppose we want to find a line. Um, so I'm going to find the equation. Equation of the line, EQN for equation of the line uh, through some points, uh, P1 is 0, 3, minus 1, and P2 is 2, 1, 2. How do we find the equation of that line? We can write it parametrically. We can say that there must be a displacement from going from one to the other. So going from P1 to P2, um, you get P2 minus P1, um, 2, 1, 2 minus 0, 3 minus 1 is 2 minus 0 is 2, 1 minus 3 is minus 2, 2 minus minus 1 is 3. It just occurs to me that I'm actually doing a different problem than the book. The book had a plus 1 here instead of minus 1, but it doesn't matter. We can use this problem. Uh, any problem will do. So we've got these two points. We've now found a vector that goes between them. It's a displacement vector. And so the line consists of the equation uh, that we can start at any, st at our st any starting point. And we can move along uh, in the direction between P1 and P2, but with any rescaling. So any scaling times 2 minus 2, 3. Um, or if you wanted to write that out, so these are the equa these are the points of our line. They're these points, uh, our initial vector we start at, and then moving in the direction of the displacement between these two points along, but by any by any scaling, because once you've got the two points on the line you can take the displacement between them and you can scale it and you'll stay on the line. So um, so it's a scaled displacement vector. So that's our scaling of a displacement vector for any parameter s. So 0 plus 2s is 2s. 3 plus t s times minus 2, so 3 minus 2s. And minus 1 plus 3s, 3s minus 1. So those are the points that lie on our line x y and z that lie on this line. So very often when we're thinking about vectors, we want to split them into our into the amount that goes in a particular direction, the amount that goes in some other direction. So if we have two perpendicular directions and we're given some vector, we want to figure out how to resolve it into being some amount of this guy plus some amount of this guy. And split it into its pieces. Um, so let's suppose we were given, um, uh, as a simpler problem, we're just given two vectors which are not maybe perpendicular to one another. In a vector A and another vector B. 
and what we want to do is to say that A should be split into some amount of B and some amount perpendicular to B. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to figure out how to split A into a piece that goes in the B direction and then a piece that goes uh, perpendicular. You can see here that's the perpendicular piece. So we can draw a little, little um, a rectangle um, where this will be how much A looks like B. It goes in the B direction. And this is how much A goes in the direction perpendicular to B. So we have to find out how to do that, write down formulas for that sort of thing. So let's suppose we try to write it in this way. A should be, we're given, so it's given A and we're given B. We want to write A as some amount of B plus some amount of something perpendicular to B. Um, but we don't know what's perpendicular to B. But we certainly, uh, sorry, uh, some amount of B plus something perpendicular to B. Um, so if we wrote it, well, the only way we could write it, the only thing we'd put in there, is it has to be some amount of B plus uh, A minus that amount of B. I mean, that's just splitting into a, a, a multiple of B and then something else. But the problem is to figure out how do we make this multiple, this one, be perpendicular? Is it perpendicular to B? That's the problem. So we want to make that thing be perpendicular to B. How do we do it? We'll just take the dot product with B. Um, so we want to make sure that this bit comes out perpendicular. So what we want is um, exactly that A minus TB should be perpendicular to B. And how do you test for perpendicularity? You take the dot product. So we want exactly that A uh, minus TB should have zero dot product with B. And we compute that and expand that out and we simply get, uh, we want to solve for B, for the unknown, sorry, we want to solve for the unknown T, that's the, that's the problem. How much B does A have in it, and how much perpendicular does it have in it? So how much B is there uh, to get? So we want exactly the right amount of B uh, that, that, that A has so that what's left over is perpendicular. So that's the perpendicularity here, and if we expand that out, we get A dot B minus T, B dot B. And now if we solve that for the unknown T, we just get that T is, bring that over here, divide by B dot B, A dot B divided by B dot B. So that's a simple formula for computing out how much we have to, uh, to how much B there is in A, so to speak. It measures the amount of B. This would be, the T would be the length of this guy divided by length of B. So T is a scale factor that's telling us how much to stretch by to say that's the amount of B that is in A, roughly speaking. Okay, it's easier to think about when B is actually a unit vector. So let's try and just see what it looks like if we rescale. So if we were to rewrite it that way, we could say that we're interested in, um, uh, say, if we let B hat be B divided by how long B is. So that's a unit vector, a unit length vector. It has length 1 because we divided off the length of B from B, but it points the same direction B did. And so then TB is simply how big is B um, times TB divided by how big is B. So it's B, T, B hat, B hat being our normalized B with unit length. Um, so that gives you some idea of what we're talking about here. And um, so then we can write this as um, norm B uh, times T has to be norm B, we wanted it to be, Remember, what we wanted was T is a, B div a dot B divided by B dot B. So if we write that in this notation, it's going to be norm B, A dot B divided by B dot B. But uh, B dot B is norm B squared, so norm B, A dot B divided by norm B squared, which is just um, dividing off is just uh, A dot B uh, hat. Or another way to write it is simply that it's magnitude A times cosine of the angle. Okay, so that's a, a convenient way to think about it to figure out what this factor is supposed to be. Or again, the theta represents the angle between A and B as usual. Anyway, we do have a very simple formula. Forgetting all of this stuff, we can simply uh, use the formula that T is uh, how much A there is in B divided by how much B there is in B, so to speak, um, or rescaled so that it lacks like B as unit length. So let's see if we can do this uh, in an example. If we try to compute out a simple example of um, of these perpendicular vectors, um, we have, let's suppose we have a vector a is 1, 2, minus 1, 
and b is a vector 3, 4, 0. And I want to try to arrange that I pull off the part of, I split a up, let's say, into some part that goes in the b direction and some part that goes perpendicular to b. So according to our formula, a should be written as some amount of b plus um, a minus that amount of b, where, uh, so this is a, a guy that goes in the direction of b, and this is perpendicular to b, so this is in the b direction, this is the direction perpendicular to b, but where we said that t had to be given by how much a looks like b divided by how much b looks like b. Um, so let's compute all those quantities here. a dot b is uh, 1 times 3, 1 times 3, uh, plus 2 times 4, plus minus 1 times 0, 0. So that gives me 3, and then uh, 8 makes 11. b dot b is 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 0 squared um, is 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, so that makes 25. And so t has to be uh, 11 over 25. That splits a up into two pieces. Uh, a is t times b plus the per perpendicular part a time minus t times b. And so t times b um, is 11 over 25 times b, where b was 3, 4, 0. And so it's not a very pretty expression. These things don't usually turn out very nicely. Um, uh, 33 over 25, 44 over 25, and 0. Uh, so, okay, so that's the part that, uh, that goes in the b direction. And then we should have the part that goes in the perpendicular direction, a minus tb. And then a was 1, 2, minus 1, minus tb was 33 over 25, 44 over 25, and 0. So putting all that together, we get um, 1 is 25 over, well, let's write it as 25 over 25, minus 33 over 25. 2 is 50 over 25 minus 44 over 25 and then minus 1 minus 0 is minus 1. Um, so we get, uh, let's see, so that's minus 8 over 25 I hope and then um, 50 minus 44 is 6 over 25 and this is minus 1. This is not very pretty but what we're finding is it's possible to split A up into a piece that goes in the B direction which is this guy here. That's how much A looks like B, how the part of A that goes in the B direction and this is the part of A that goes perpendicular to the B direction resolving it into the two directions. Okay so an application of that idea as our last step today is to think about how we would figure out how far is it from a point p naught uh, in space to a plane, um, to some abstract plane, um, plane cut out by some equation uh, ax plus by plus cz is d. So this is some point, and this point has some position vector x naught, y naught, z naught. And we want to figure out how far is it from here down to here. What's this distance? How do you calculate that, a formula for that? If you had any point in the plane, let's suppose you have this point R, uh, then R is some point, uh, say x1, y1, z1. And you want to work out um, what, this, the, what this distance is and try and see if you can get it to be as small as possible by choosing the r correctly. So then there'd be a vector here, which we'll call a. a is, um, is going to be um, this, uh, this vector here going um, from uh, in, in this, uh, this um, uh, triangle. Sorry, I don't want this to be a. I want this to be, this will be a. A is going to be going this way. Um, so we'll let A be the difference, which is just uh, going to be, um, sorry, and I want it to be this way. I'll let A be this vector going this way. So A goes this way here. So A is P, uh, is R minus P naught. So it's going to be X1 minus X naught, Y1 minus Y naught, Z1 minus Z naught. Okay, so. Um, 
so then what we want to do is to uh, split into pieces our equation for this guy is this uh, multiples of x, y, z is d, but that should be normal dot x, y, z equals normal dot c um, equals normal dot p, uh, uh, oh, sorry, equals normal dot c. Um, so that's going to be the, uh, the equation. So the normal vector is going to be the vector that appears here. So the normal vector is going to be a, b, c. It's the components of the linear equation. So we can say that um, the normal vector um, is going to set it, relate to the to the vector a here, which sorry goes uh, this way. Um, so this vector a here is going to have a uh, dot normal vector is how long is a, how long is normal vector times the cosine of the angle between them. Um, and so the length we're looking at is going to be um, the length of a cos theta equals, um, that's going to be uh, the length we're, we're interested in finding, a dot n over n. Um, and uh, we can just calculate that out. So this, this uh, gives us exactly the distance we want down here. That's going to be, uh, sorry, that's, this is a, then this must be a cos theta for the theta being this angle in here. And so what we're getting is exactly the distance we want to measure is given by this expression here. And we can plug everything in and get this a um, and this n. So that's going to be a dot product of uh, a dot n. Now a is x1 minus x0, uh, y1 minus y0, z1 minus z0. And then n has got components called a, b, c. And then uh, the length of n is in the bottom, which is squared a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So we can now expand all this out and get, um, on the top, we're going to get an a times that, b times that, c times that. So it's a x1 minus a x naught plus a y1 minus a y naught plus, uh, sorry, b y1 minus b y naught, c uh, z1 minus c z naught all divided by the square root thing on the bottom. Um, and then finally, we can plug in the fact that we know that the point um, that we were interested in, uh, we were interested in a point, where was it here? This point was supposed to satisfy our equation, it was supposed to be on the plane. So it's r is on the plane, r is on the plane. So the plane has this equation of the plane. And so r satisfies the equation of the plane. So let's plug that in. R satisfies the equation of the plane. That means this guy here, um, let's see, plus this is supposed to be B, Y1, C, Z1. Those are the components of R. And they're supposed to satisfy the equation of the plane. We plug in the equation of the plane there. We get that that's you know, this times this, this plus this plus this is D. So it's D minus AX naught minus B, Y naught minus C, z naught divided by square root a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So that finally gives us the equation for the distance. So let's f sum that all up um, as an equation that we can write down. Um, we have a plane uh, ax plus by plus cz is d and a point p naught with some uh, coordinates uh, x naught, y naught, y naught, z naught. We want to find this distance here. Um, the distance, oh, sorry, I should call it D. Um, let's call it capital D, is distance. Uh, we found that the distance is exactly, capital D is exactly um, magnitude of D minus AX naught minus BY naught minus CZ naught divided by square root A squared plus B squared plus C squared. So that's the capital D distance here. Um, okay, so we found a formula explicitly computing out the distance, and we did it really by resolving, by taking an arbitrary point on the surface, resolving this guy into this triangle, and then trying to figure out how we could make, uh, compute out this part of the triangle. It's easy to plug actual numbers into this equation, so I won't go through an example. You just have to plug in lots of numbers. Let's, let's see if we can do some examples of these kinds of calculations. Um, so if we were to get, be given a point, so this is exactly the same uh, recipe I just wrote down, P 
because it's easy to use. But uh, let's suppose we were interested more, more geometrically in taking um, points P1, P2, and some P3 as, um, and let's find the distance between, um, let's say, from P1 to the line uh, through P2 and P3. How would you work out that distance? Okay, it's a similar problem. Um, it's almost the same story. So we've got these two points. I won't know where exactly they are in space, but there's two points in space, and there's a line between them. And there's a third point somewhere out there. It's just this P1. There's some P2 and some P3. Now we're trying to figure out how to calculate uh, where would we go if we wanted to we'd find the shortest the shortest distance between P1 and this line should be this perpendicular to the line that goes this way. So that's the problem we want to try and solve. Let's see how, how we can do it. First, we can work out what is this vector that goes from here to here. We take P3 minus P2 um, as a displacement. So P, uh, P3 is 1, 1, 3, and P2 is 4 minus 2, 5. So we take 1 minus 4 is minus 3. 1 minus minus 2 is 3. 3 minus 5 is minus 2. So this is the displacement vector going this way. And so we can figure out what are these, um, uh, what are the points on the line because they're given by taking P2 and then adding any displacement, any multiple of this to it. Now what we're going to do is simply to take this vector here, this displacement, which is the displacement P3 minus P1, going from P1 to P3, and then we're going to try and figure out which, how, how, to, how to break it down into a piece that goes this direction. So let's do P3 minus P1 is 1, 1, 3, minus 3, 0, 1. 1 minus 3 is minus 2. 1 minus 0 is 1. 3 minus 1 is 2. So there's a displacement vector going this way. Now, how do I minimize the distance? Um, if we draw the picture again, we can see that the idea is simply we had, so we had two points, P2, P3, and we had this line between them. Um, we have this displacement vector here, we have a point P1, and we've described a displacement vector going this way. What we'd like to do is to resolve this displacement into a piece that is uh, in the direction of this displacement here, uh, so some piece like this, and then some piece normal like this, which would, it shouldn't go straight to P2, but it should go somewhere. Um, so it goes to somewhere on this line. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. I'm going to take this displacement, I'm going to take this displacement, and I'm going to resolve the displacement vector here to a part that goes along the line direction, like this, and a part that goes perpendicular to it, and that's going to be the length that I want to calculate. So we want to take um, I want to take P3 minus P1 is some amount of P3 minus P2 plus some perpendicular amount. So we write it as, so if we write these vectors as um, P1 minus P3, we call this B, and P2 minus P3, we call this A. And so what we want to do is we want to write uh, that B um, has to be TA plus um, uh, B minus TA uh, with a perpendicular part, and a, uh, with these two parts perpendicular to each other, right? So T has to be chosen this way, and we know how to choose that T. T has to be simply um, B dot A over A dot A. Now the letters A and B have changed from when we reverse wrote this down. That's why they're different uh, than, than you remember from the previous uh, formula. But... Um, so we've reversed the roles of B and A when we've written them all down, uh, uh, unfortunately. But anyway, that's the, that's our formula that you have to figure out how to split the thing into a piece that's that goes in the, the A direction, a piece that goes perpendicular. You take how much B looks like A divided by how much A looks like A, and you uh, use that as your scalar. So we can calculate this out. We know what B and A are minus 2. Uh, 1, 2 is B. And if the dot product with A is so dot product minus 3, 3 minus 2, and then we divide by a dot a, minus 3, 3, 2, minus 2, um, and then 
minus 3, 3, minus 2. So we calculate out those dot products, and that gives us a total amount of, um, of 5. I won't do the arithmetic. That's 5. That's 0.22. And um, so then we can get um, uh, splitting into, into the pieces. Um, we get a, a, a P1 to, um, let's say this point is supposed to be Q, a P1 Q uh, vector, which is uh, uh, the, um, the splitting here. Um, of this guy into its bits, and I want this part here, so it's this by b um, two my minus two one two. That's b minus t times a, and a was uh, minus three three minus two, and this t we've got here, so it's minus two one two minus five or twenty two minus three three minus two, and if you compute that all out, it's very unpleasant. Um, you get 1 over 22 times minus 29, 7, 54. And so finally, you can calculate the distance uh, between the two is the distance. So the distance from uh, P1 to the line uh, from P2 to P3 um, is uh, the distance between P1 and Q, the length of that vector, and so it's exactly 1 over uh, 22 square root of these, some of the squares, minus 29 squared plus 7 squared plus 54 squared, just some horrible mess. It's square root 173 over 22 or something like that, um, apparently. Um, so I won't uh, go through the arithmetic of calculating it out. So that gives us an example, though, of figuring out using this idea of resolving things into their into the perpendiculars and the and the non-perpendicular parts. Um, we've taken uh, two points. We found the the displacement going from one to the other, uh, going the direction of the line. And then we've taken a point somewhere else in space, and we've tried to figure out how to get it to displace between the displacement between it and this point of the line. We've broken that displacement B into a part in the A direction and a part perpendicular to the A direction. That perpendicular part is going to go from P1, displacing us down onto down to the line, down to some point Q on the line, the closest point. Um, so that's how we can uh, organize a calculation that tells us how far is it from this point to go to this line. In our next lecture, we'll think about linear equations and systems of linear equations in any number of variables.